Welcome to the SBP Podcast, Mobile Filmmaking. I'm your host, Susie Botello, and you're listening to episode 107. So sometimes I go into Instagram and I'm looking for people who are creating films. And once in a while, I really, well, most of the time, be, let me be honest with you, most of the time, I can't tell the difference between a film shot with whatever camera and a film shot with a smartphone because the potential for a high-quality film is there with a smartphone just as it is with a regular camera. Now, let me put a little disclaimer to this. Just because you shot a film with a traditional or a professional camera, right, does not mean that your film is going to turn out all right. Any filmmaker knows, and I've been behind traditional cameras uh, for, for a living, um, and even on, you know, I got to uh, DP for a film before, a short film, but in any case, there's a lot to learn there, okay? <laughs> there's a lot to learn, and you've got to, you kind of got to get a grasp on it. You got you to gotta learn, you got to figure out what you're doing, and um and make it come out right so not everybody knows how to do that well regardless of the camera the fact is though with a smartphone and apps like filmic pro lenses like moondog labs and capturing great audio most of the time externally uh you're going to come up with some pretty decent results and then it becomes something that you can't tell the difference between the two But let me tell you what the bigger difference is between any film, regardless of what it was shot with. That is, how captivating is that film? How engaging is that film? Well, that depends on something that's really important, the story. And if you want to make it a better film, that's what you got to focus on, the story. So I go on Instagram, and I'm looking, you know, looking around, and I find little films, you know, or clips of films or whatever it is. And I found this one about the American Revolution. And it was like the, you know, a battle scene. And I thought, wow, you know, how cool is this? Now, 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 look, it was just like maybe 15 seconds worth. But I thought it was pretty well, pretty well made. Um, And I made a comment to uh, the guy that posted it. And I said, hey, did you shoot this with the with a mobile phone, and he says, uh, no, he did not, but he did shoot something before with a phone, but he, he, you know, he didn't do anything with it. Um, and I thought, well, you know what? You got to do something with that. You got to submit it to San Diego's International Mobile Film Festival because that's as big as a pitch as that sounds. That's what I do. I encourage people to do it. So. I invited him to do that, and finally, for the 2020 edition of our film festival, which ended up online thanks to the pandemic, uh, he submitted his film, and it was accepted. And we talk a little bit about that in this episode, because yes, that's what this is coming to. I invited Jason C. Marshall to come on this podcast. Maybe not just for this one time, though. Because one of the things I realize is that the power of filmmaking isn't just about the camera, isn't just about, you know, the act of making a film, obviously. Um, It's about the stories that you can tell and how good of a story you can tell. So I invited him in to come, you know, come on here, share storytelling with you so that he can pass on some of the things that he knows, some of the things that he's learned with you, because I think this is only going to benefit you. Because what I really would love to happen here is that the next film that you make, you take some of these things into consideration, the storytelling part, that you've learned something from what Jason is going to share with you. And you're going to keep these things in mind when you're writing your next screenplay and designing your next film. And story becomes to shape your film more than, you know, the, the gear that you're using and, and, and the fact that you're using your smartphone and all the other fun stuff that goes into filmmaking. That you're going to concentrate more on the story. 
You're going to have fun with that. And it's going to make your film better. Why is that important? Because when your film shines, I will invite you to come on the podcast to talk about it. You will probably win in the film festival or at least get accepted into the film festival because, you know, we're looking for really great films, shout with smartphones, and you will get into more film festivals and you can be the next Sean Baker at Sundance with your film. And who knows, you may be the first mobile filmmaker to actually win an award at Sundance. Wouldn't that be wonderful? In the main competition, to be one of the top awardees at Sundance or Cannes or, you know, have your, your film picked up by Magnolia Pictures. And, I'm, and I'm, I, I know you're going, hey, Susie, I'm not there yet. But you can, you can literally get there. So we're going to concentrate on this. We're going to concentrate in this episode on things like uh, story arc and story structure, the beats, the plot, all these things. and. I hope that you get a lot out of this. You enjoy the conversation. You really dive into it with us. And, um, oh, and by the way, when we get close to the end, you're going to find out something about Jason that's related to the series on HBO called The Nevers. Uh, But I'll leave, I'll just drop that little, you know, hint here and you'll learn about it in the in this episode so are you ready let's dive into the story In Canada right now, uh, we are going to speak with Jason C. Marshall. Is C? Can you see? Is C the right uh, way to do this, Mar- uh, Jason? <laughs> oh, oh, oh! I can, I can see. And there's a, there's actually a funny story behind that. Is there's an in back in my smaller hometown. There's another Jason Marshall, mm. who is not quite as, not quite as honest as me. And I kept getting mistaken for him on, you know, with the police and having my bank account frozen and, and whatnot. So uh, I had to see a lawyer and he's like, you should start, you know, putting your middle initial in there. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> and then you get your C vitamins, too. Does anybody exactly. ever give you that? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, I want to share with our listeners that Jason, uh, we met Jason through this podcast, actually. He was a, a listener just like you. And um, I also met you uh, on Instagram. You did, a, I yes. think it was like a Civil War or a Revolution film that you were working on. It wasn't shot with a, with a phone, guys. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. No, Sorry, I, I just, over you. It's, you, you know, you don't know how good my memory is sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I asked Jason, you know, oh, did you shoot that with a phone or something to that matter? And he said, no, I didn't. But I did shoot something a long time ago with the phone and he submitted it to our film festival and it was a good little film. And so it got accepted. And, you know, just one thing and another, um, one of the cool things about Jason, which I I want you to share, um, is uh, what happened in 2018, because in 2018 was a big year for Jason, where he realized, uh, we were just talking before this, that, yes, he made films, but he doesn't feel that they were good enough films because he found out that stories matter. <laughs> and so... All right. Oops, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I did it again. No, no, that's fine. Um, so stories matter. And so when he, he had that explosive moment in 2018, uh, a lot of things happened. He made a lot of things happen. And so I want you to go ahead and share with our audience 
where you are today and why you are here. Okay, I'll try to be as succinct as possible because I can get <laughs> chatty. Um, I just want to very briefly, briefly I want to talk uh, about the the first thing you mentioned the um, the Civil War or the, it's actually American Revolutionary War. It's actually a friend of mine's film. I was helping helping him out for the day. It's called Soldier in the Barn. I don't know if it's finished yet, but they were able to get Civil War or pardon, yes, uh, they were able to get reenactors. Right. with the appropriate costumes and they even hired um, a gentleman to come in and do explosions so there's actual ground squibs I guess or the the larger equivalent um, it was a pretty fun day for that one anyway but that has nothing to do with uh, what we're talking about right now which is um, as you said I uh, I made a film uh, called apparition and entered it into the I believe it was 2018 2018 it might have been 2019. It went into to the International Mobile Film Festival. Now, it was actually written by a friend of mine um, who I had made films with originally back in 2004, to give you an idea of how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we were, like, this, is, this is the bad old days. This is, you know, a Canon GL1 with, with mini DV tapes. Nice. Like, oh, nice. My I God, come I from that background, I, too, but GL2 for me. Yeah, I actually had one of those too. I ended up buying. I ended up using both of them, but trying to color match the two of them was a oh yeah uh, unpleasant, very unpleasant. Uh, anyway, so he moved out to BC, and he is a uh, paramedic EMT, and he had lost his first patient call. I'm not sure what the proper term is when an EMT takes care of someone. Um, and he wrote this little script, uh, kind of to help him work out what he was feeling and uh he sent it my way i'm like yeah we can uh we can we can make this happen and uh we uh we knocked it out uh i think we actually we shot it in a day uh using a uh at that time i was using a lg v30 nice yes because i was interested in the having the automatic setting or not the automatic settings the the built-in uh, manual controls instead of using uh, a Filmic Pro at the time. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so we put that together. And at the same time, I had made some films with, this, with some other people. I looked back at my previous films to say that, hey, these aren't, these aren't good. Now, in all fairness, in 2004, the resources for writing didn't exist as they do today. So I gave myself a bit of a pass there. But I started looking at why, why aren't these as good as they should be? <clears throat> Excuse me. You know what's missing. So I started looking into, into story and funny, funnily, funnily is that the good word? Is that even a word? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, now I'm questioning it. <laughs> yeah, see, see what I mean. This is why I said I can, I can talk and talk and talk. So you might have to do some editing. <laughs> no, no, not at all. This is um, this is intriguing. Uh, that's fair enough. And I think I just snorted. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bob Odenkirk and David Cross, who did Mr. Show, and they've all they both gone to their own careers, you know, Better Call Saul and uh, and Arrested Development. They wrote a book called, I believe, it was Hollywood Said No, and that kind of set me down a path that led me to uh, Blake Snyder's Save the Cat. Yes, and this book, it's it's like. It's like the Rosetta Stone. It's like movies suddenly became, a, you know, engineering diagrams, exploded diagrams where they, it looks like everything's been taken apart and you can see all the pieces that make the whole. Oh. That's how I can best describe how Save the Cat impacted me. It was like, okay, here it is laid out in simple terms, the elements that make a movie. Now, I've had to explain this to other friends before. Blake Snyder didn't invent structure. Blake <laughs> Snyder, through listening to movies when he did this drive between L.A. and somewhere else, made the connections of all these movies that are good have these same elements in the same place. He just named them is really what it came down to. Yeah, and nobody invented storytelling. Yeah, no, no, it's just, it's just these... These things that naturally work in this order right. is is yeah is is what he and he just he didn't discover that I mean I guess he did discover it technically but you know what I mean 
Um, or no, you don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but I do, a, I do yeah. understand. It's like when you're making, because mm-hmm. that's how my, my mind works. It connects things. Everything connects, and that's how things make mm-hmm. sense to me. And then I can express them through that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so this was this was great because it was just like it was like it, it was it was literally a world changing book. It's like okay, here is everything you need to know to craft a good story. So then I could go back and look at my old stories and say, here's the things that didn't work. And now I understand why. And even then, moving forward, it 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 it, it led to a process of analyzing movies. Like I would start looking for things. Which has kind of expanded to, to where I am today. Where I'm, some look at. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a field yelling at myself because getting people on board with structure is sometimes hard. Mm. Because there's there's there are those who believe that formula is bad and you can't make anything new and original, and that's absolutely incorrect. But so I've got to a point where I'm more. I've I've spent considerably less time filmmaking, and more time learning, writing about, and sharing, sharing all these story elements to the point um, you and I hadn't touched on it. I'm actually in the process of developing my own system, course, whatever you want to call it. Cool. Um, so, like, look like, at like the Blake Snyder "Save the Cat" is great, and I recommend it to absolutely anyone. But after reading other books like uh, Story Maps, um, Robert McKee's story, uh, I would recommend John Truby's Anatomy of Story, but I have to admit I haven't read it. I'm, there's something about it that's just not as engaging, and I'm really having a hard time getting through it, and I, I, don't, know the, I don't know the why. But I do know from snippets I've read and bits and pieces, it is, it is a solid resource. So okay. from all those things, I've kind of, I've kind of put, I've kind of developed my own thing that's very similar to Save the Cat, but slightly different um, because there's some terminology I don't like. Um, the order of theme, especially, I'm not, I'm not super keen on. Let's so if, talk, if you're familiar, let's do this. Let's bring up okay. three, you know, so for for our listeners, just just to mm-hmm. simplify this a little bit for them. So, right. so in 2018, you, you, you started, you know, you were working on films, you made a film that your friend wrote, right? Mm-hmm. And then you, um, you, you, you began to notice things about that, um, that brought you into researching more about yes. storytelling. And now mm-hmm. you're, now you're in the weeds of the whole, uh, storytelling um process right and so oh very very much <laughs> yes so now let me bring you out of the out of the weeds a little bit um to mm-hmm. simplify it for our listeners because you have there's three really basic things that everybody understands even you know when we begin expressing ourselves through storytelling when we're about what three three years old uh mm-hmm. there's a there's the beginning there's the middle yep. And there's the end. Mm -hmm. Now, if we could just leave it like that, that would be great. But it's a lot more complicated than that. And when we're talking about films and making films through storytelling, there's a difference between what a film does as opposed to what reading a story does. Um, Mm -hmm. And one of the things that films do is they allow you because they're, they're basically using all your senses, right? Uh, they yes. allow you to become a part of the storyteller's world. And you are now feeling the, the, the characters, you know, the protagonists of the story. It's now mm-hmm. your story as a viewer. And I think that's part of the reason why a lot of directors are in love with theaters. Because all the lights are off, you get the best sound, you get the best, but that's if mm-hmm. you can get it, right? <laughs> if the, if <laughs> yeah. the theater next door isn't playing a Marvel, Marvel movie with all the big bangs coming through the walls, <laughs> but if you can get it, right, the experience yeah. is, is magical because it, can, it mm-hmm. can almost transform you for the hour and a half to two hours or 
three hours if it's something like Lord of the Rings. And you are <laughs> able to escape. And even psychologically, right, it's, it's, um, it, it can break you out. If you're depressed or if you're feeling anxious or, or you're really stressed out, you go to the movies or you watch a movie to escape reality, your reality. Yeah. And so the, the, the beginning, the middle, and the end, it's almost like our own life, right? We begin here, the, 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 you know, our past, our present, our future. And mm-hmm. one of the things that, um, uh, that I was sharing with, with Jason earlier was how we do this thing where it's, it, I was calling it a game between the storyteller and the, the consumer, the, the viewer. Uh, where it's this little bit of back and forth um, with the plots and the twists and the the mysteries and the captivation, you know, oops, I'm hitting my <laughs> mic, uh, the captivating part of, of the experience for the viewer because you got to keep them captivated. But you mm-hmm. also have to give them a little bit of satisfaction, curiosity, you know, like uh, oh, what is that thing that you do with um, – uh, in the old cartoons that you see where somebody's got a, a toy mouse with a string and they keep pulling it a little bit for the cat to chase yep, it. Yep. And then they let the mm-hmm. cat pounce on it for a second and then they pull it away again and then they pounce on it again. So they give the cat a little bit of satisfaction. Otherwise they lose interest, right? Um, so oh, it's kind of like, kind of like that uh, in a way. So, for our listeners, because what we want to do for you guys is we want to help you turn your films, right? Turn your stories, you know, because this could go either way. Turn your films into good stories <laughs> or turn your stories into good films. Um, <laughs> they both require that same uh, recipe, right? Yes, exactly. So, as we were talking about before, um, it's the... When when a a screenplay is written well and then translated into a, a good film, everything in a film is set up in payoffs, and that is is leaving the breadcrumbs the right amount and the right size of breadcrumbs to keep your audience hooked. Because part of the fun of a movie is when it's engaging, and you're guessing, and you know what's going to happen next, and then you know the satisfaction of knowing that you're right. Like, you, okay, I'm a detective. I put these pieces together. Um, but I want to swing back to earlier, and if you'll bear with me for a second, talking about when I realized my films, previous films did or didn't work. And that is the one thing I've diagnosed in my own films and from having watched lots and lots and lots and lots of Indian amateur films is they tend to start at at the disruption moment or the catalyst moment, as Blake Snyder calls it, which is the, you know, the more familiar term. And they skip the first couple steps, which are the setup, the reason we care about the characters in the first place. We need to see what their life is like at the start. You know, at the present, what's their life like? Is it good? Is it bad? How are they at home? How are they at work? How are they at play? I need to know who they are to know why I'm going to care about their journey. Yeah. So this comes back to what you're saying with the beginning. So proper setup and laying out just enough little clues to keep people hooked and interested and, and guessing and engaging with your film from beginning to end. Yeah. Because it doesn't always have to follow that order. It has to include it in your story. Yes. You do want to satisfy beginning, middle and end, but it, it doesn't always start. There's a lot of movies that start out with the end. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it, it, technically, you know, it, it's one of those things, too. Like, because your, your opening image, your pro, I call it the prologue. Um, we'll talk about that, you know. Yeah. Afterwards. Um, because the ending can still set up everything to everything that came before it. So, you know, like you said, it's okay to start at the end. If you know. How, but the thing is. You can only get away with that if you know how to properly craft a story and understanding structure. Yeah, it's like it's Understand, like, a, it's uh, like yeah. a tease. Yeah, exactly. Understanding yeah. structure is 
the best way I can say it is it's understanding why things work in a movie. Mm-hmm. And you can't really write a good movie till you understand the elements that need to be there and why they work together. And it's all about the audience, the viewer, how they're going to well, perceive exactly. things. Because as much as you think you're in control of your own emotions when you're watching a movie and the perceptions, <laughs> yeah. you have no control whatsoever. It's all no. the, the filmmaker is the one that's controlling everything you're seeing and feeling every little aspect of it and why. There's no, mm-hmm. you know. Well, yeah, it's it's set and once again. If there's I'm, a little I shadow make, over there, it's not because oh the director missed something. No, you're meant to see that shadow. Exactly, and that's that's what makes movies satisfying is it's the little the little details. And uh, I'm going to steal a line from uh, the guys at Red Letter Media. Um, Mike Staclasa uses this all the time. You might not have seen it, but your brain did. <laughs> and that's then that's very it, it, it's it's a very apt description because when done right everything on scene or sorry everything you see on screen serves the end goal of of telling the story and it's not always dialogue it's subliminal mm-hmm. it's in the wardrobe it's in the set design it's in the lighting it's in the coloring it's in these little little details that that pay off big time there's so much psychology to it oh i know <laughs> It's, uh, it's when, I mean, I guess if someone to ask, was to ask me why I love movies, it's, it's this, it's tell me a good story that's engaging from beginning to end. And, you know, a good story isn't, isn't necessarily all high drama. You know, when you look at, when you look at the Marvel movies over, over the 20 some movies, the character arc and change especially for, you know, the Tony Stark character and the Captain America character. It's incredible, and I never would have guessed in 2008 that, you know, Iron Man would end up where he is. Hmm. Once again, like, I know some people don't consider, don't consider the you know, have a low opinion of the Marvel movies, but when you, when you look close, it's all there. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, there's um I try to um share with people sometimes how there's a lot of basics to stories that change with different films like the Titanic, mm-hmm. Pocahontas, uh, um Romeo and Juliet. There's a lot of similarities in those stories, right? But they're mm-hmm. each one of them is a completely different movie. Yes. Yes, the um I mean, obviously, as you said, pardon me, the, the individual, the individual elements within the story are significantly different from one to the other. But if you, if you take a look and break them down, which very quick aside is something I'm, I'm meaning to do, uh, some video essays and, and movie breakdowns that, you know, I've been getting to for like two years now. I'll eventually get to them. <laughs> um, I actually, um, I have uh, one of the things that I've, uh, whoops, I hit the wrong thing here. Um, when I mentioned I'm kind of building up toward, you know, a course or materials to help people write, one of the things I'm currently working on editing is a, uh, it's basically a worksheet. So we haven't gotten to the, we haven't really gotten to the weeds yet, but it's two <laughs> things. It is its structure on one side. So it's, it's like a spreadsheet where, you know, one column tells you what the beats are, where they are, and what they are so you know what to put. Then then an open space where you can put your Explain notes. Explain to everyone what beats are because that is a very oh, common yes, term. Oh, yes, right. Yeah. Right. Pardon me. So, yeah, getting ahead of myself. So uh, I'm going to back up a little bit and kind of tell you how I approach this. Like I said, it's heavily, my approach is heavily based in Save, by, Save the Cat because I had a lot of respect for that material. But after reading other stuff, as I said, I've kind of, I've kind of worked things slightly differently. So as far as total structure goes, you have acts, which are essentially, th- those are your big sequences. Now, I'm going to vary a little bit from things right now because, you know, they always talk about three-act structure and that kind of bothers me. Mm-hmm. Because when you when you break it down, they're like Act One, Act Two A, Act Two B, and Act Three. I, I don't. I'm not on board with that because 
I don't know why we're trying to arbitrarily fit things into a three act when movies are generally a four act, four act thing. Because I've heard this before. Okay, you yeah. So there yeah. you go. So I I I break movies down into four acts. Um, so the acts are your big sequences, which pardon me. Sorry, give me a second here. I got like fifteen. You got 15 spreadsheets. Windows open here. <laughs> yep, I got a bunch of stuff open here. Um, sorry, I apologize for this. Um, okay, so four acts. Act one is your setup. That's establishing the world and who the character is and why we should care. Act two is actually a reactive phase where they've left their normal world into a new world where everything they learned before doesn't serve them well. So they go through, you know, in, in comedies, this is where all the funny stuff is. Then you have your midpoint, which is, like I said before, they call it act two. It's the break between Act 2A and 2B, which I said, no, 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 it's not. That's a separate act break because after the midpoint, you switch to an active phase where your characters are active in their pursuit of their, their plot goal. Got it. So that's your, third, that's your third act. Then Act 4 is the resolution where you get your climax and then your epilogue and everything's wrapped up in a nice happy bow, ideally. <laughs> so within those acts are story beats. And as I said, my, my approach is slightly different, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still the same. It's, we're all, all of us who do this are doing the same thing. It's just slight, slight variations on a theme. So uh, the beats are the moments within, pardon me, I want to say it again. Those are the big moments within an act sequence. So if you're listening, if you're looking at, uh, a graph of music, right? Because mm-hmm. the word beats, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the highs and the lows, mm-hmm. which is what distinguishes one from the other, right? In right. the space of that, uh, of a track, right? An audio mm-hmm. track. Um, would that be something very related to what you mean by this? Uh, quite possibly. Um, honestly, I, I'm not particularly good with music. <laughs> well, if you look at so, an audio track, you know, or mm-hmm. if you're having a heart attack, uh, an EKG, <laughs> okay, um, yeah, or or earthquakes, right? There's the highs and the yeah. lows and the peaks and the- right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, a, a beat, a beat would be would be a high. It's where it's where something happens to the character that caused them to change change direction, as it were. Right. So, like I said before, you know, you got your your you generally open up with a prologue, which is just something to establish the world and tone and mood and, and all those things. And then there's the, like, this is all in the setup phase, that, that first act. And, you know, so we learn a little bit. Then you have the normal world. You need to establish, like I said, your character, where they live, who they are, what they like, what they don't like, friends, work, family, et cetera, et cetera. So you establish who they are in the now. Then you hit them with a disruption, which is kind of like the halfway point of, you know, your first act. Something happens that turns their world upside down. Got you know, it. whatever it may be. Then um, then there's some discord, you know. It's the call to, the you know, they've just had the call to adventure. Do they take it? Do they not take it? You know, and that, that kind of finishes your first act. Is, you know, it's like, what do I, what do, I do? Do I go, do I go after the thing or do I... Do I keep living my normal, unsatisfying life? Whatever. Right. Then, you know, they, then they, they, I call it enter the matrix. Mm -hmm. Um, That's just, that's just the moment they make the decision that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go on the journey. And then virtually the entire second act is, is the upside down world. It's, it's, it's the antithesis. It's the opposite of everything they know. And they don't know how to navigate this, this world they're in because, like I said, everything that's everything that's served them before doesn't work. And Blake Snyder talks about this, the midpoint. It's what it's what I delineate as the act, as the you know the break between Act Two and Three. Um, and this is where, you know, they have they win the fight against the enemy, or they get the girl or guy, whatever the whatever the case may be. It's the big moment where. All the lessons they've learned in Act Two in the Upside Down world, you know, they're able to put them put them together and you know 
have a big win or loss, depending on your story. And then you're into Act 3, which is the active phase where they're actively, okay, I've, got, I've learned some lessons, I'm going after this thing, I'm going to get it. But at the same time, you need to raise the stakes. Like, okay, we, you know, we, we robbed the bank, but now the bad guy is gonna, gonna bomb our fort, and they're closing in. So how are we gonna get out of this mess? You know, just just more. You're more intensifying stuff to like, okay. the suspense too, in a way. Yes, thank you. Yes, that is a, a much more elegant way than I put it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this this is one of the spots where I really where I really kind of veer away from um, like the save the cat because at this point he has Blake has a double bump where it's like value despair and um, all is lost moment. Mm. But you can do this in a different way. And my approach is that you have the value despair where it looks like everything is they've lost everything. You know, you know they're in the in the pits of everything's gone wrong. You know they they don't have a chance of winning. And this is when you know they 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 pull up all their their energy for the one final push. We got a new plan. That's when the viewer is like, "Oh no, no way! Yes, this exactly. This can't be true. Exactly. Right now, here, exactly. And what you can do here is, you don't necessarily need two beats, but if your story requires it, just add a second beat. Gotcha. You, like you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we had the valley despair, but no, it it's not bad enough. So just add one more thing if you need to. <laughs> but it's not necessarily required. Um, and then you get into get into the final act where you have your your revelations. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to use a specific example here. Uh, the first Wonder Woman movie. This is a really good example where, where uh, she learns from Ares the truth. You know, it's the movie was made in 2017, so I'm not too worried about spoilers. <laughs> right. Um, because through the whole movie in Wonder Woman, her goal is to is to stop Ares, and then mankind will be good. But then she learns the truth that, well, mankind's good and bad. He just gives I just give them information, and they do with it what they want. Um, so she has a revelation, and then she has to decide whether to whether to fight the bad guy or join the bad guy. Obviously, in that movie, she fights the bad guy because regardless of how good or bad man is, that influence is destructive. Then you have your climactic, There's climactic like, whatever. It doesn't is it, have to, um, you know, we haven't even talked about subplots yet. <laughs> well, exactly. I'm going to I'm going to swing back to that um, because I do have some some thoughts. I, I have specific spots on that. Um but yeah, I so said just to wrap it up, you got climax, which is you know you fight the bad guy or you run through the airport, whatever, and then the the epilogue is where you wrap it up, and it's you know, it you know most stories are a positive, have a happy ending, but it's basically you, you can mirror the mirror things you showed in the beginning, but the important thing is to show that the character has changed in some in some way. Yeah. Um, now coming back to what you're saying about about uh, subplots, there's two things I want to say. And that is that... Um, uh, give me a second here. The um, the B story, like you just said, your subplot, which is oftentimes romance, um, you kind of, you kind of hint at it a little bit, depending on your story in the, in the, in the first act, but you really establish it once you hit the upside down world. Mm-hmm. So like... Um, they meet, you know. I'm gonna come back to Wonder Woman Lux. I've actually studied this one more deeply than most other films. Um, in in Wonder Woman, Steve Trevor is the is the impact character. He's the character who most who gives her the most information to to become a more complete person. But he's also the romantic partner. But they don't set that up until. Act two, when they're doing the um, doing the little dress montage, and he comes in and she's wearing the final outfit, and they just do a really good good close push in on his on how he's looking at her, and you're like, okay, boom, B story. We know there's in this case the the B subplot is a romantic plot. Stop me if I'm not making any sense or talking. No, too this fast is or great. This is throwing, great. Throwing too much stuff out. Um. 
Now, there is one thing I want to talk about, and that is theme. Um, Blake Snyder has a moment uh, called, you know, uh, a theme establishment or established theme. Um, I've left that out for a very specific reason, is that during the opening, you do set up a central theme. Now, in the case of, once again, Wonder Woman, the characters say two to three times, you know, you'll do nothing. Or Steve Trevor's like, my father said, you can either do something. You, if you see injustice, you can either do something or do nothing. I already tried nothing. And her mother's like, you know, no, you're not going to go with him. You're going to do nothing. So kind of, you know, a central theme for the character is, do you fight oppression or not? Is, is you know, in, in those, in, 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 that's the best terminology I can use. But like a TV show, Wonder Woman hammers the theme home at the climax where she says, um, you know, something along the lines of, um, you know, love is stronger than hate and I believe in love. And that is, that's the theme of the movie, but it's not, but they don't say at the beginning, they say at the end. So that's as long as you right there. Exactly. But as for theme, because look, there's a central theme, but generally speaking, if you, if you really look deep, movies tend to have several themes happening at the same time. So the important thing is to just, if there's something you want to say, hint at it or establish it in that first half of act one. Yeah. But, but you can, but you can hammer it home at the end. You don't have to, you don't have to hit people over the head with a hammer at the beginning. Because movies are art and art is subjective and every person is going to get a different lesson from it based on their own, um, their own life experience. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you and I watch the same movie, we can get two different messages from it. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I, I like I said, no, I, can, it, I can really talk about this stuff. No, <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Um, what I want to do, um, though, is establish really in a simple way how people, let's say that someone has a, because the one thing that you do is first you write a treatment, right, for the most part. Mm-hmm. And then you write, you know, it's uh, it's like an outline in a way of how, how I mean, the word itself, treatment. How are you going to treat this, well, exactly. this story, this the, film? Uh, um, and, and you do want to, even if you don't have to have a structure to do that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, mm-hmm. For someone, especially when they're first starting out. But the one thing that's really yeah. important to do is to write some sort of a screenplay or uh, an outline of some sort so that you don't miss things and so that you you get these elements um, and you work them into your into your story as great as it is to just start shooting yeah. you know yeah. we've tried that it doesn't work right. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it works but yeah. um, but when you're talking about a narrative you know in a in a film you do want to and you don't I mean even the most experimental and music videos even have stories to them um Mm -hmm. and and they're they're not like this for the most part but but you do want some element of that because we are captivated as human beings um through storytelling you know yes and and that's how we kind of comprehend things like what i was saying about three years old right Mm -hmm. uh when we begin you know we start to tell stories and and yes. share stories, and that's how we we realize that's how um, people understand what we're trying to say. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. The um, come back to what you were saying about about outlining. Um, every person is going to have their own their own way. Um, I I post I posted several on my Instagram because I actually because I'm very very structure oriented Mm -hmm. um i actually i actually outline my films from beginning to end using using beats and acts like on my whiteboard i you know i write down prologue and then you know here's where i'm starting and then for each beat i i i I note i you know i i just put down you know jot notes of of things i want to happen within that um and then that gives me that gives me my outline, and then I can go back and, and start backfilling the uh, 
the details and working out scenes and then then dialogue and you know it's just kind of you know just follow it down the line till you till you get it done but yeah other people are you know much more freeform than i am and i i very much i was uh, just thinking (laughs) about this i was thinking you know (laughs) jason what would you do right um because you're thinking right now that you're directing right that you're Mm going to direct your story your film yeah but that doesn't always happen that way no uh, and so then what do you do when you're, or, or even as a director, right. Who, who wrote this thing, if you get really stuck on this, right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you're, you, it's, you're dancing through it in a way when you're in production, because mm-hmm. there are things that are going to happen. There are always things that are going to happen. And, and then you also have, you have these characters, but these are, these are, actors right who mm-hmm. are human beings who also have their own experiences and sometimes they have a lot of experience and they can help you uh say you know what i know you're really stuck on this but i think if you allow this if you allow me to do it this mm-hmm. way it'll it'll portray this and still satisfy that type of a thing mm-hmm. so it's one thing to maybe bring up with our listeners you know, how you still do have to have an open mind, even though you have mm-hmm. all this going on, right? That we just talked about. Yeah. Or maybe the, not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I said the, the, the best example I can give is, is the times I've, I've done consulting for, for others, um, which is something I, I, would like to, I would like to build on because I very much like that. I very much like when someone brings me a story, they're like, I need this, I need to tune this up, but I don't know what to do. So they give it to me and I read it over and then I send them back, you know, notes. I'm like, okay, here's, once again, here's where you miss structure. I've rejiggered a bunch of things. Here's things that don't work. Um, there was one example, a, uh, someone reached out to me about a, uh, a film. It was about tennis. And there's a lot of back and forth on this because he was like, oh, that sounds too formulaic. I'm like, if you don't want formula, don't make it. <laughs> Because he was like, there was one element, one thing that happened. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. He's like, yeah, but it happened in real life. I'm like, yeah, but you're not making a documentary. You're making, you're making a work of art that is fiction. So all I can, so when it comes to that, because, you know, you, everyone makes their final choice, you know, depending on the advice, whether like they like it or not, or you can convince them of the merits of it. But... When someone sends me something, I give it a read, and then I immediately apply structure to it. And then send it back, say, here's, read this, here's structure applied to your, your script. Then come back to me and we'll start, we'll start working at the back and forths. And in cases that they're like firmly like, no, this absolutely happened like this, it has to happen like this, um, I kind of very gently nudge them in the direction that Yes, it happened like that, but given the time and effort involved in making a film, do you want to make, do you want to, do you want to die on this hill about something the audience isn't going to like, or do you want to make a compelling movie? And generally, with a bit of conversation, they come to the conclusion on their own that, okay, yes, we want, we want a good narrative. Um... And at the same time, they'll present stuff to me. I'm like, okay, that thing you said is way better than what I came up with. But we only came up with it through collaboration. The conversation. Exactly. So I, I don't actually know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, you <laughs> did. I mean, so so basically you, you, you have to take everything in a way, you know, we're talking about getting in and out of the weeds mm-hmm. uh, for the most yeah. part. and. This is an artistic, um, we're talking about mm-hmm. artists, right? There's a yes. science to this as well. That's one thing that I mm-hmm. always say about film is how beautiful uh, the combination of art and science that comes to play mm-hmm. together and why, why it's so unique in that oh, sense, absolutely. you know? And part of that science is the technology, but it's also the psychology. And it's something that, 
through the beginning of time up to now, you know, thousands of years, uh, humans have established in communication, which is stories and storytelling. And mm -hmm. so when we're talking about artists, so artists feel things, you know, and perceive things and they have a need to express things. And it's very hard uh, sometimes to get out of the weeds that you're in as an artist. Yeah. The, um, the, well, I mean, that, that's actually, that's a good point because a lot of people, a lot of people have trouble letting go of story elements. They're like, I came with this thing and it's so good. But then when you read it and you kind of, it's like, it's, I'm sorry, it's not as good as you think it is. And it is going to hurt your overall project if you leave it in. And your audience, you have to think about your audience because your audience exactly. is not always the artists. They're not all artists. Well, exactly. You know, it's like I say, you know, sometimes the, the people that care about the films and how you make a film are the filmmakers, not the viewers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, I have a, I guess my best opinion on that is that, uh, the best, let's see if I can say this in a way that isn't gobbledygook. Um, <laughs> consider your audience, but don't, don't make your film for an audience in that. Oftentimes, the audience doesn't know what they want until you give it to them. So yeah. if you have a vision, if you have a vision, a story you want to tell, you should tell it. But audience consideration does need to factor into your your creative calculations, as it were. Yeah. If that... Yeah, that's the that dance. Makes sense. That's yeah. the dance that you got to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm no dancer, trust me. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. So when you're telling people, um, you know, we're talking to, to people right now, we're, we're saying, we're, we're telling you right now, you, the individual right now <laughs> listening to this, you know, yes, make a movie, shoot it with your phone. You've got it. Part of the, the beauty and, of, and, and the, um, the power of making a movie with your phone um, is the fact, and I've learned this from many filmmakers that you have listened to in this podcast, and if you haven't, go back and start listening, um, is the fact that they're able to get their mind uh, a little bit out out of the, you know, the technical aspect of filmmaking so that they can concentrate on the story, you mm -hmm. know, and in the production as a whole, right? And by doing that, you know, you're paying, you're paying attention to that story and how you want to tell it and how you want it perceived. And all of that comes into play. There is an art and that, that, that puts more of the individual artistic you into that. And there's a science, which is the outer circle of that. Um, and then outside of that is whoever is good, because you don't really know who's going to watch your movie. You know? Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, I mean, you got to play to them because there is that science of, you know, because like I said earlier, you're going to control what they feel. Mm -hmm. Um you're not always going to control the message that they get out of it and their mm -hmm. perception of it afterwards. But throughout that journey of watching your film, you do have control of that. That's, that's part of the power of, of film and filmmaking and storytelling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, um, it's actually, um, as an extension is, uh, what I was talking about before is, yeah. As part of the, the thing I'm trying to develop, which like I said is still in the editing process because I, I put down a lot of information. It's a lot of information on this worksheet. But the, col the one column you know, on your left has all the, the, the structural beat stuff we talked about already. But the next column is character arc. And this is very important mm. because, because screenwriters and probably novel writers, I would assume, have a tendency to treat... Structure, character arc, and plot as three different things. But the whole thing is, is the arc. Exactly, because 
you only get plot if you have structure and character arc. So what I've done is, and they said this is still, still a little ways off, but might as well talk about it now, is this chart has all the structural beats. And the next column over is all sorts of information on character arc and where the character arc moments have to fit relative to your story beats. So you can map your structure and your arc on the same workspace and in the end you're going to have a compelling story with a solid plot because you can do everything in one space without having to refer back to mul the the goal is to have a single source worksheet where you don't have to constantly look back at other notes yeah yeah and, yeah because you don't uh, want to so, yeah, so, complicate it because then hmm. you lose it right that's what i wanted to say i meant to say this earlier so blake snyder's save the cat you know blew up the world for me as far as understanding how movies <laughs> work but K.M. Wyland's character arcs was a complimentary piece because it it added that extra element that okay because she explains character arc relative to story structure like okay now I get it I understand the pieces that, that all the pieces that have to go together to give me a compelling story because when you work with these two things, you don't have to think of plot as a sec as a, another item because it it will have developed naturally from the from the mapping process. Yes. It's, so, yeah, it's sorry, in a way I like when I tell earlier. when I tell people, um, a lot of times they go, "Well, I I can I can use the camera and and shoot, you know, I can come up with some sort of a story, blah blah blah." But forget the editing. I I don't I don't understand that and blah blah blah. And I'm <laughs> and I'm telling people. Look, you just start like even transitions, right? When you're putting transitions mm -hmm. between shots, you know, or yep. scenes actually, because you don't really do it between shots, but mm -hmm. you use the transitions and you just drag one onto the timeline there and you put it in there yep. and you realize, you realize what you're doing by doing it. Because yes. we've grown up generation after generation watching so many films. Mm -hmm. It's like it's in our genes. It's in our DNA now. It's like we know mm -hmm. things that we don't know how to explain how we know them. But as soon as we start doing yeah. them, we go, aha, uh -huh. now I know that this is... transition causes this effect and that one doesn't. Right? That actually makes me, that actually makes me think of something about coming back to, it, it, come back to structure again. Because they said, that's my thing. I'm going to talk about it a lot. <laughs> um <laughs> is that you're right we've been watching movies for a hundred years more probably yeah okay yeah. so yeah so exactly more and i've talked to people like have you ever watched a movie and you can't explain it's not good but you can't explain why it's not good they just know it's not good i'm like i can tell you exactly what it is there are structural elements missing or they're out of order because things didn't happen in progression you've been trained to expect through the process of watching movies. And that's why understanding structure is so important. I know in, in my classes in college, one of the things that I thought, well, I could have done this at home. And, and the instructor was like, no, you couldn't have. Because <laughs> cause I was like, I come to class and you're telling me to watch movies. Like I could just do this at home. You know, and he said, no, yeah, but can... we're going to discuss it. We're going to break it down and you're going to see how all these things fit together. And there it is right there. Yep. It's 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 that it's that second part. Yep. That... But that's the thing, too. Uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of Conrad Mess. You I have not. Of... OK, so Conrad Mess was the the first filmmaker to make a cinematic film. Right. Uh, with okay. the iPhone 4. Uh, okay. Back in 2011. Oh, maybe, maybe I had. Yeah, maybe well, I he's have. on mobilefilmstories.com. If you go okay. to mobilefilmstories.com, uh, he's, he's got a page there because it was epic. He was the very, yes, I've mentioned him before. He was the very mm -hmm. first filmmaker to submit a film to the film festival and just blew me out okay. like, Thank you, God, for this gift <laughs> <laughs> validating my vision uh, of the future. But what he did was 
he was, you know, when I was talking to him, because I got to know him and, you know, we became friends and Mm -hmm. he never went to school to study filmmaking. His whole thing was he grew up in Spain. He's in Spain. He grew up in Spain Mm -hmm. as a little kid watching movies. And every time he watched a movie, he was thinking, I want to be, I want to do that. I want to be a director. Mm-hmm. I want to be a Tarantino or a Spielberg, you know, like a lot of kids yeah. do. Well, when you're going to film class, right, you're obviously there because you want to make movies, right? And right. so when you're watching these movies, it is, is what I'm trying to say is, You've been watching movies your whole life, and so have your parents and your grandparents and your neighbors and your the guy at the grocery store. So you're you're everybody gets that, and you don't. When somebody watches a movie, they don't consciously know why that scene doesn't work for them. Yeah, you just turn them off, but you don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know why. They can't tell you why. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Your casual viewer doesn't. Yeah. It just, it just, it just, it feels wrong. Yeah. So there are rules and it's hard yep. again with the artist part of the filmmaker, right? That sometimes you're going, mm. this isn't going to work oh and my. they get insulted <laughs> because no, this is my film, you know, <laughs> and it's their art oh. and how dare you, you know? And it's like, but there is a, an expectation, a science that goes to this and you mm-hmm. can't just break it. Like you can, you know, They're, like an abstract uh, painting. I, if you if you allow me to, yeah, to go for, for it. A minute, the 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 amount of times I've had conversations where I'm asked, "What camera do I get?" I'm like, "Use your phone," because <laughs> because it doesn't matter if you buy a uh, uh, Sony A7 III or an Alexa or an Red if you don't. Making beautiful images isn't going to make your film good. And the fact is, you're probably not likely to be able to get the images you want out of that camera anyway. The important thing is to craft a story that is compelling because the images matter less than the story and the audio. But I get pushback, which is forever frustrating, with comments like, as I said before, the whole... uh, we don't like formula because nothing new ever comes from formula. I'm like, well, that's incorrect. Or <laughs> <laughs> my favorite is I don't abide the rules of filmmaking. I'm like, okay, well, then don't be a filmmaker. Don't be mad when you don't get accepted to festivals or people don't like your work. Because, look, if you want to make films, if you want to make whatever you make for the sake of making it for your own satisfaction, you should absolutely do that. But if you refuse to follow the rules, as it were, right. then don't be surprised when your movie's not successful. You had an opportunity to learn how to do it, to learn how to tell a story that, quite frankly, learn how to tell a story to convey the message you want to help or convey the message you want to send that, that will impact people and honestly potentially change lives depending on the depth yes, of your story. you can change the world with a good story. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And even and not even on that scale, sometimes if you impact one person. Then then that's a win, I think. Yeah, anyway, there's, rant, there's, rant over. It just it, it's it, it just it's I'm sorry. It's just forever frustrated to try to be like, hey, here's how to do it. It's super simple. Why are you refusing? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know when you were naming film festivals, I can tell you right now, there's, there's something I'm connected to. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. and that has to do with the fact that there's, there's, you know, the film festival itself has to think about entertaining the audience as well Mm -hmm. and, and, and providing value to the audience as well. And they can't have as much as they want to sometimes because, you know, they like a particular topic or something like that. And Mm -hmm. they want to say yes to that film. But they have to yeah. think about the event itself. You know, they, we, I, uh, we don't want people getting up and walking away, whether it's online, no, where no. they're going to click away or whether it's in a it's in a in a live environment. Well, yeah, exactly. You said, as you said, I'm just 
Peggy, I'm just going to repeat what you just said. It's about the audience. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, hey, look, when I when I entered Apparition uh, in whatever year I did. Yeah. Um, I think it was twenty. It must have been twenty nineteen because it was so. twenty. It was twenty. It was tw- it was twenty twenty. You were it was online because of because of COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was twenty nineteen. I was like, I was worried. Like, is this going to be good enough to get in? But I was pretty confident it would get in just because the content of the story and the ultimate messaging is is pretty good. Yeah. Um, See, but yeah, the that 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 that's a chance you take it. It's and not getting into a festival isn't necessarily a reflect, reflection of the quality of a project either no it's also well in something i do a little a little differently too i do consider the filmmaker as mm-hmm. a whole because to me the filmmaker that makes a film that submits it to our film festival is now a part of the community and yes. i do want you jason i do want you you know whoever it is listening right now um, I do want you to make films. I do want you to be mm-hmm. inspired by what you're listening to here. And if we happen to meet at, you know, a coffee place and you and I are talking, that's just my thing. I want you to make mm-hmm. a movie, you know, and I want you oh, to make absolutely. more. And so when you submit one film to our film festival, um, that's that's great. And there's there's something because of, uh, who I am and what I stand for and what my passion is that sometimes I look at a film from a filmmaker and I say, you know, this is not that great, mm-hmm. you know, as a short film, by the way, not a <laughs> feature film, but as a, as a short five minute film, uh, I can say, you know, this is not that great, but there's something about this that I know that is going to grow with this filmmaker. You know, yeah, and exactly. so the well, next it, it's, film. Yeah, it's, it's identifying, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, identifying the um, the potential, I yeah. guess. And I, I, I do, and just even recently, you know, with our last film festival and this film festival and all film festivals that I've had for the most part where people will email me and ask me questions and things like that. Um, maybe the film is a little too long or, or this or whatever. Mm-hmm. and um, you know, I'll have to break, break the rules, right? Uh, break it to them that, yeah, you're stuck with the rules. You know, we can't go, we Mm -hmm. can't go around that, you know? And then they'll surprise me and say, okay, well, I've got another one and I'll submit that. And I'm like, so freaking awesome. High five you, Mm -hmm. you know, you rock. It's like, it's, it's incredible to me because I don't like letting people down, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and and but but anyways, when it comes down to to a film festival, or if you're talking Netflix, or if you're talking Amazon or Tubi or whatever you're talking about, you got to remember that entity, right? That that organization, whatever it is, they have a an obligation to the audience, just like you do in a way. But if you mm. want to make a film just for you and your crew or whatever then you have to know that from the beginning and say to your crew, we're just going to make this for us and our children and grandchildren. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Cause you don't want to bring people in to do all that work to have it. (laughs) Yeah. That's a, yeah. (laughs) It's filmmaking. Filmmaking seems like a terribly fun idea until you start making a film and it's, it's, it's hard work. It is. But then if you've done something right, in the end, I mean, I've, I've worked on films that have been very, very challenging. Uh, you were talking mm-hmm. about your film of the revolution and you were talking about the, the reenactors and everything. And we mm-hmm. had the same thing, the one that I worked on. That's my favorite one that I ever worked on was in Big Bear. And that, that, that thing was an adventure. I could have made a movie about my experience in working on that film. And yeah. I have to tell you, though, that as tough and challenging as it was, I would do it again on a heartbeat any day, mm-hmm. every day, because it was such a beautiful experience. And you do get to make you do become part of a family. Yes. When you're making a film. So you don't want to really let the people down 
you know, everybody's there mm. and they're knocking their butts off, right, to, to make it happen. And they believe in you. They believe in your story. They believe in, in, in the act of, of the production. They, they believe that you're going to put this in post-production and that they're going to see it, uh, a film festival or somehow that they're going to see mm-hmm. it and they're going to get that satisfaction from that. The, um, there is, uh, you're saying about you being part of, you know, being part of a family, part of community. There is a very robust, uh, amateur film community here in, here in Ottawa. Um, several thousand members strong. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely, definitely (laughs) hit me up. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a good community. Um, not a virtually nothing in the way of mobile, mobile filmmaking. Although I did convince a couple people to try it. So that's, that's something. Um, but uh, a very supportive network of people that help each other and, and make things happen. And uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's it, something it nice. is true. And, and a lot of times you end up going, Hey, let's find another excuse for getting together and making stuff happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. And what is the best excuse? Let's make another movie. There are tons yeah, of exactly. stories out there, you know? Yeah. Well, especially now that things are, oh, I mean, I don't know how it is down in down San Diego. Things are things are opened up here for the last last few weeks. Not not a hundred percent, but you know, reasonable capacities. You can eat indoors and go yeah, inside we places go, again. We go in through waves. I mean, we're we're opening up pretty well here um, mm-hmm. in San Diego for the most part. I mean, when they mention the numbers of you know the people that are vaccinated and the people that are you know, getting sick, but then, you know, you hear about the hospitals and then you hear about, you know, so it's hard to tell, but for the most part, um, you know, we are planning an in-person event next April, Nice. you know, and there's something you can't bring online about the, the in-person events. And one of them is going to be, hopefully that Jason will, will be here for that. No, that'd be, that'd be cool. Yeah, I gotta get a passport. I gotta get a passport. <laughs> <laughs> you should have a passport no matter what, yeah. because we've all seen <laughs> too many apocalyptic movies not to have a passport. You know, want to pick up the the yeah. Elon Musk. Actually, I uh, I actually have I have I have something to submit for twenty twenty one. I didn't think I did, but then I remembered we um we made a short film for uh, a uh, a female film female filmmaker here in the city um you know she's moved on to she's out in bc now but i asked her if we could submit it and this is a fun, fun little project we kind of put it together and for they 2022 did, they did you mean though yes right right, right. yeah okay i was like right. what right yeah it. what year is it <laughs> well right now it? it's 2021 <laughs> yes. but it's for right, 2022 yes. yeah. 40 yeah exactly so yes so for the next one um it was fun it was a guy it was a guided improv actually nice um don't don't uh, give it away chelsea yeah, no, no, I won't. Chelsea, but Chelsea yeah. had the idea, then got the actors together, and they just, you know, we met at Starbucks, they worked it out, oh. then we hopped in the car and made it happen. That's and it was that's it a was, story it was right the, there. It was the the smoothest, smoothest thing we've ever put together, and I also learned one thing. Uh, I set up four lav mics in the car, one for each person, and I end up using the camera audio. Right from the right from the iPhone 11. Because the acoustics because the, be, in the car. The acoustics in the car are amazing. I'm like, well, who needs to build a sound booth? <laughs> go rec- go go do your ADR in the car. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. Lock yourself up in a I trunk, do, guys. <laughs> yeah. So I do. I do have something to submit for for this this upcoming festival. Oh, that's festival. incredibly awesome. I love it. Well, okay, we're wrapping up um, here. Right. So what right. is oh, yeah. what is <laughs> the um, you know, and, and by the way, what, what Jason was just saying that's really also incredible is the fact that he wouldn't have this crew, this little family that he made, uh, would not realize one more thing. And that is that they made and had a great experience making a film and they wouldn't have known that was the case unless they did it. So you have yep. to do it. You have to, you have to just, just start doing these things. 
And the other thing too is you start to find out who you want to keep and who you want to throw back in the water <laughs> when it comes yeah, to crew, yeah. right? Well, well, yeah. Because I mean, look, not not everyone gels, and that's right. that's okay. No, it's it's fantastic. Uh, Jason, just mm-hmm. just give everybody something that they can hang on to, like like the uh, like the end point of a movie, something that they can chew on after uh, they turn off this podcast. This episode. Oh, uh, wait, do you want something philosophical like or <laughs> well, uh, the world will be? No, something about um, what we were just talking about, the storytelling and the structure mm-hmm. and everything. Something you really want them to take home so that they can go back to the beginning and start getting a story together okay. to make a film. All right. Um, OK, here it is, regardless of where it's from, whether it's from. Save the cat from myself, from any other number of sources. Learn structure, learn character arc, live it, love it, because that is your guaranteed way to making successful films is by telling compelling stories that the audience can empathize with, with characters they want to know, character journeys they want to follow, and have a message. Something you want to convey in your story that, as we said, will impact lives. Even if it's one person, someone out there is looking for the story you're trying to tell. You know, there is something about that, about the message. And sometimes the filmmaker doesn't realize it until the whole thing is done and that film has played somewhere. And someone walks Mm -hmm. up to them and says, I love the message in your film. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, exactly. That's a glowing moment for a filmmaker. Sometimes they just don't even realize what that is, you know, that they actually were able to convey that, and they don't know mm-hmm. how good that's going to make them feel. That makes that's the sugar right there. <laughs> yep, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. Well, um, say. Uh, by the way, we're going to throw some links in the notes. Um, we always write an article. Uh, on mm-hmm. Medium for this, and I'll put a link up on the high on the notes for you to go to to read that, um, where mm-hmm. we'll have for sure all the links. You can find me on Instagram at Jason C. Marshall, and um, there I post the various things I'm working on. Um, between that and all the, the posting I do about the, the, the scene by scene breakdowns I've been doing of uh, the Nevers TV show. Yeah. Oh, you know, let's let go ahead and tell them about that a little bit because that's a celebratory thing. Yes, that is actually, um, like I said, between between what's happening there and you asking me to come on today's podcast, it's been a pretty uh, pretty cool. Uh, what year are we? Twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. So the far. Champagne. Um, <laughs> yeah. So so I had I hadn't planned on watching the Nevers the the, the new TV show. Um, I just stumbled on it, and I kind of got hooked. And I was feeling very ambivalent about filmmaking and writing in general, like, kind of the point, like, what's the point? No one's listening. You know, I might, at some point, you'd only talk to yourself so much. But then I saw how well it was put together. You know, obviously, it's, it's amazing. It's a show on HBO, so the script is already solid with structure and character arc and whatnot. But it's the little things, the production design, wardrobe, hair, color choices, setups and payoffs, the amount of foreshadowing, especially in the first episode. They tell you, once again, it's that whole breadcrumbs thing. They, they, they tell you so many little things that when you get to the episode six, um, the season break, you're like, oh, wow, how did I not see that? It was all there the whole time. <laughs> um, so I started just doing posts about the things I noticed and it's become this scene by scene uh, breakdown. Yeah. Um, that just, it just, that wasn't the plan. It just kind of happened on its own. Um, and that got the attention of the Matthew who runs the HBO Nevers fan site. Um, they also have a podcast, uh, the Nevers podcast, but he asked me if I'd be interested in writing articles for them. So I've done three so far and, um, Obviously, all that stuff is on my Instagram. Uh, the website is hbonevers.com, and my articles are in there. 
And I apologize, Susie. One more thing as far as things falling up my, in place. My good friend Julie and I have started uh, recording movie reviews. Wow. Um, I'm hoping if everything goes well, I will have we will have the first proof of concept. Not not really a true episode. It was just a test. Can we do this? It should be posted on the day this comes out, and I'll have the links on my my Instagram. And it's, it's like I'm more, I'm more active on Instagram than anyone than anywhere else. Right. Um, but I'll I'll give you the links for well. For that's the where other, we like, met, Twitter kind of, and, and whatnot. Though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, um, here's the thing. So, yeah, so if no, you follow, yeah. yeah, if you follow Jason on Instagram, then everything is going to come together right there, just like a great, a great movie. Because then you know you're following him, and then he'll come out and say, "Here's my new website. Here's my this. Here's my that." And all these things will be accessible there. So that's probably the best thing to do. Well, yeah, exactly. And the other thing that I I haven't done it yet. I mean to is video essays, uh, specifically movie breakdowns, applying structure as we've talked about. So, yeah. by example, I'll do a number of movies. Here's structure. Here's character arc. See, it's the same everywhere you go. Um, so yeah, yeah there's a number I, of things. I that really, are, yeah. guys, I really want you to understand, you know, the storytelling aspect of filmmaking. You know, because you have a camera in your in your hand right now or sitting right next to you or in your pocket you have it with you and it's the most empowering device that you could have if you could go back to the days of the cavemen or whatever right the one most empowering tool they had was like a it was like a rock and a stick right mm-hmm. and everybody had it and they used it for everything it's it's the same thing with the with the smartphone and what Dollars. you can do with that is, is actually tell stories. And I've said this here and I've said it so many times before. Stories, you know, if you watch The Walking Dead or any of the zombie or apocalyptic movies, you'll notice how fast money is meaningless and worthless. But the things that bring the characters together to help each other and survive are the stories they tell each other because that's what connects them and brings trust to their story, to their journey to survive. Mm -hmm. So there's a very empowering tool that you have right now, and that is a camera, and it's on your phone, and everyone has it. All you need to do is work on your story to make great films, not, not just for our film festival, but for humanity. And send mm-hmm. some messages out there and change some lives and change the world, guys, because you can do it. Jason, thank you so much for, for being on the show. We're going to definitely invite Jason again. You're going you're gonna to see, hear. <laughs> <laughs> hear me? Hear me. <laughs> hear, hear more from, from Jason in the coming uh, every well, we'll we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, look, yeah. If you're gonna give me if you're gonna give me, give me a platform to talk about story, then I will I will absolutely get my 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 Apple box out and you got it. Start start talking. Um, I just want to throw this out there too for anyone who does uh, check out my Instagram. Feel free to hit me up. I know Jason, you're on Twitter, but you're rarely hardly ever there. Yeah, it, I, I've been I've been a bit more uh, honestly I've been a bit more active lately because of the stuff I've been doing with the with the Nevers site. Um, just because I'm finding I'm getting more engagement on those posts over on mm-hmm. Twitter than I am on Instagram. Yeah, Twitter is um, a wonder jam. <laughs> so I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to find it. I'm trying to work out a balance. Um, it just I really just I like the visual element and the fact that I can tell longer stories in the captions on Instagram. Oh yeah, definitely. So it's um, yes, but yeah. So I'll I'll give you I'll give you my links that you can share, and then of course anything that goes to you, you can just tag me in if you need me to. Yeah, need me to, yeah, definitely. To jump in. So Jason, I don't know what you what you are. I know it's really late over there where where you are right <laughs> now compared to here. Um, oh, it's, we, <laughs> it, 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 it's two a.m. It's on only Saturday two a.m. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much again. Say goodbye to our listeners. Well. Uh, well, I can't believe I stumbled over that. <laughs> Thank you, listeners, for listening to me me talk loudly and 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 at length about story. 
And uh, thanks for listening to the show. Uh, Susie is a class act and uh, someone who I did not expect to become the friend she is uh, after first just finding her podcast. So keep on listening because there's value in this show. Yeah. Let's inspire. Let's inspire each other, guys. See you on the next episode. Take care, everybody. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.